Well, welcome to our series on By Faith as we continue in the book of Hebrews chapter 17. Today we're going to talk about validating our faith. Um, as you saw in that vignette of that guy losing his job and looking to God, you know, our faith is always going to be tested. And let's just be honest, we don't like tests, right? Uh, at least I didn't ever like tests and kids I hang out with never liked tests either. You know, when I was a kid, we didn't, didn't love them. I remember being in grad school one time and and uh, it was right before a, a, a big final exam, and, and I had gotten up really early in the morning. Like, I used to get up 3.34 in the morning to study straight through to the exam, oftentimes, so it would be fresh in my mind and all. And I, I remember two guys standing around talking and saying, you know what, we're in graduate school. We're in theological training here. I don't think we really should have tests. I think we should just learn for the sake of learning. And I looked at that guy, and I'm, in my mind, I didn't say this to him, but in my mind, I thought, what planet are you from, man? I got up at 4 a.m. this morning to study for this test. I'd still be sleeping if I didn't have a test today, man. Forget the level learning stuff, you know? I mean, we need tests, right? And that's why we have them, and God understands that, that faith is not faith if it is not tested. Now, we've been talking a lot about faith, and we've been talking about a mustard seed of faith, and we've been saying that faith, really, even if it's just 1%, when it's accompanied by 100% of obedience, is, is great. But at some point, you've got to understand something about faith, and that is that it has to be validated. Faith is not faith unless it is tested. And that's one of those things that we don't always understand and we don't always get. That's why James, when he starts his book of James chapter 1, he says, Listen, consider it joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And then he talks about the result that that's going to have, that you're, you're going to be complete. And, and, and sometimes we feel like faith isn't very fair, you know, that God, you know, shouldn't be testing us. Listen, Here's what you need to understand about God. God didn't even exempt his own son from testing. Do you realize that? Do you know that Jesus' faith needed to be validated as well? In fact, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Okay? He had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and he became hungry. And that's when the test came for, for Jesus Christ to be tested. Our text today is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. It says this, By faith, when he was, get this, tested, offered up Isaac, who had received the promise, was an offering up to his only begotten son. Okay, verse 18. It was him to whom it was said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. So the promise of Abraham to be a great nation was going to go through the line of Isaac. That's the one that God called him to offer up as a sacrifice. Verse 19, here's what it says about Abraham's faith, okay? He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead from which he also received them back as a type. These three short verses today we're going to dig into and look at a threefold test that God takes Abraham through, testing his love, testing his emotions, and testing his commitment. Now, here's what you need about tests in your life. God customizes tests for each of us. Your test is going to look different than my test, but I can guarantee you this, if you are a follower of Christ, God is going to test your faith. Sometimes you're going to pass, sometimes you're not going to pass, but the fact of the matter is we need to be prepared for testing to validate our faith. And lest you believe that somehow God is doing it because he doesn't like you, understand that he's actually doing it because he loves you. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 12, the next chapter after Hebrews chapter 11, after coming through all these amazing examples of people who had great faith in God, here's what the author of Hebrews says in verse 3. Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Don't get discouraged. Don't, don't, don't lose your heart here. You know, look at Jesus. Look what he did. And then he says of us, you have not resisted yet to the point of the shedding of blood and striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. And it says this, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he 
disciplines and he scourges every son whom he receives. God's testing does not become a source of contention for us with God or shouldn't be a source of contention for us with God because in fact it's a result of God's great love for us. Now we don't always see it initially but with this entire story we get to see God's amazing love. So let's look at the testing of Abraham's faith. Now for the actual test itself we get to dig back into the original story found in Genesis. A lot of Genesis happens to be dedicated to Abraham Abraham is an amazing guy in a lot of ways, but back in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, uh, repeating what Hebrews says, it's where it started actually, it says, now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham, okay, and he said to him, and Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, go to the land of Moriah, offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will tell you. And so here God comes to Abraham, speaking to him, and gives the ultimate ask. Do you know what the ultimate ask is? It's the very hardest thing that anyone could possibly ever ask of you. That's the ultimate ask. And God comes to Abraham with the ultimate ask. To which Abraham has got to be thinking, God, you gave him to me. You promised. You said it was through him that all of the promises that you made me would be fulfilled. And and, and it's interesting that here he says, take your son, your only son whom you love. Uh, Question, theological question for you. Was it his only son? No, it wasn't his only son. He had actually had another son. For those of you who maybe don't know the story, the backstory of this, it turns out that God had promised that there would be this son born, and when Sarah and Abraham were old and didn't have any children, Sarah goes postmenopausal, says, well, now it's impossible. I'm not going to be able to have a child. So she helps God. She says, okay, so, you know, here's a legitimate way for us to fulfill this. You know, we'll take my maidservant, and she will she gave him to her husband so that they could conceive and have a child. And it's kind of like the foster adopt into a home kind of deal, you know, that they did. So that, that Ishmael now would be the one through which the promises would come. And then something miraculous happened after that. And, and by the way, Sarah, from that day that she gave her servant Hagar to Abraham, was absolutely and utterly miserable. She became the laughing stock. And, uh, and Hagar didn't make it easy on her, by the way, as you read the story. We get a lot of detail there that's, that's really remarkable. And you, this, you pity this poor woman who, you know, what a noble thing to do, you know, to, to be able to sacrifice your own heart and your own desires and all those other kinds of things and, you know, to try to fulfill a promise that you believed was, you know, and your best intentions trying to do and all of those other kinds of things only to become mocked and all of those other things. And then finally the miraculous happens and she has a baby. And she does have a child. They name him Isaac. And suddenly everything changes. Her countenance changes. Her attitude changes. But you know what? Her heart was filled then with bitterness. The bitterness that had always been there. But now she goes to Abraham with the ultimate ask. <laughs> okay? This is the first ultimate ask that, she, that Abraham gets. All right? And she basically says to Abraham in Genesis chapter 21, you can read it there in verse 9 if you want to read it later. She says, you know what, I'm not going to have this boy here any longer. Send this child and this woman away. And Abraham, it says in verse 11, he was distressed greatly because, why? It was his son. I, I, I know it's difficult, I know it's challenging, Sarah, but please don't ask me to do this. He, he's my boy. And then God comes to Abraham and says, do not be distressed because of the lad. He says, you know, listen to Sarah. You know, Isaac, your descendants are going to come through him. But, but I'm also going to make a nation through Ishmael, okay? Um, and by the way, <laughs> that nation that came through Ishmael is why we have all of the conflict in the Middle East today. To this day, it continues to be the source of conflict. 
between the, the Arabs, okay, and all of those people around Palestine and, and the, the Israelites or the Jews. Um, to this day, there is that problem. And so, and here it is, so early in the morning, Abraham rose, and he took bread and a skin of water, and he gave them to Hagar, putting them on her shoulder, and, and, and gave her the boy, okay, so it gave food and water, and the boy, and he sent her away, and she departed to wander about the wilderness of Beersheba. Now, the Lord took care of her, okay, but it killed Abraham to do this. So to go through this experience and then for God to ask what Sarah asked, the ultimate ask, to go through this again, I can't even imagine what's going on in this in his, the guy's life. I mean, can you imagine? No, God, I've already lost one. I'm not going to lose another one. You know how long it took us to get this boy? Are you kidding me? Besides, he saved our home. You remember what Sarah was like. You remember how she was and how it just literally was the savior of our home. She's a different woman. She's like the old Sarah, only better. The one that I remember before Ishmael and all of those other things. Her joy has come back. Her love. I can't tell. I can't do this to her, let alone what it's going to do to me. God, if you loved me, why would you ask me to do something like this again, only worse? And yet, God is asking him to give and to sacrifice his son. And, and there's all kinds of reasons why he shouldn't have done this. I mean, all kinds of reasons why he shouldn't have done this, okay? Um, child sacrifice was a Canaanite practice that was an abomination to God. Everybody knew that, all right? Besides, one of the commandments, thou shalt not murder, okay? We're going to be violating a commandment here when I do this. And God, you specifically promised me that all oh, the heirs are going to come through Isaac. How is that in the world going to be fulfilled? And so all kinds of doubts and reasons, good reasons, by the way, why he shouldn't do this were hitting his head. Satan loves to use our doubts, leverage them with some really valid good reasons. The same thing he did to Eve in the garden, okay, is the thing that he does to us all of the time. And now Abraham is left with this issue. What am I supposed to do? Okay, what am I supposed to do? Um, the big ask from God. Clearly God had spoken to him, so it wasn't a question of whether God had spoken to him or not, but the issue for him was, was he going to do it? Because he doesn't have the best track record, if you dig into his history, of always doing things the way that God says you should do things, okay? He, he, he really did struggle with his emotions and making some poor decisions in the past. So the ask comes, and what's very interesting about this is that the verse 3 in Genesis 22 um, says, you know, that he got up early the next morning to take his son on this journey. What I admire about him is that he didn't wait. He didn't wait days. He didn't wait weeks. He didn't wait months. He didn't think about it. He didn't contemplate it. He, uh, he just did the Nike thing, right? You know, just do it. He didn't think about it. He just got up the next day and headed out on this journey. And so it takes us now into the emotions of this man has for his children. And now we get to see the emotional side of what he's going through on this journey. He rose early the next morning. He saddled up his donkey. He took the two young men with him. He split the wood for the offering. They rose and, and, and went to that place which the Lord had told them. And on the third day, he raised his eyes and he saw him from a distance. This is a three to four day journey that Abraham, an old man at this time, takes. Kind of like a father-son trip with two servants, okay? And, and the, the modern day equivalency would be a hunting trip for dads and, and sons. Now, I didn't grow up in a home where my dad was a hunter, so we didn't go on hunting trips, but I kind of lived a little bit vicariously when Rich Fisher was with us, and, uh, you know, Rich would always tell the stories about, you know, hunting trips, and then, you know, when his boys were growing up, they're about the same ages as my kids, and maybe a little older, but that, that you know, he would come back on a weekend and on a Monday and tell us about a hunting trip that he had taken his boys on and those kinds of things, and then Adam came along, you know, and Adam told about these exotic trips that he went on hunting with his dad 
that. And then when Connor came along, then all of a sudden he's taking Connor on these hunting trips and they've never, ever missed a dove season opening and all these other kinds of things. You know, there's something about a bonding that takes place when dads and sons go together on some kind of trip together. And that's kind of what this was. It was a father-son trip. It was a three-day journey together, and they were going along. And yet, think about the emotions for a moment of Abraham, who was at this moment utterly alone. Even though he had two servants and his son, all he had on that three-day journey was that loneliness of his own thoughts with no one to talk to. And I'll tell you what, there's nothing worse than being all alone when you're surrounded by people. And what I know is true is that every week, even in a church the size of our church, you know, we'll have 12 to 1,500 people here on a Sunday, on a weekend. And uh, there are people here sitting in a crowd that are utterly all alone with their own thoughts because of the trial, the test that they're going through with no one to talk to. That's exactly where he is. It's amazing how pain isolates us. And so here we have this self-imposed silence. You know, what's he going to do? You know, he can't tell his wife what he's going to do. There's not a way in the world she'd have let him go. Not going to tell his son, oh, by the way, son, it's a three-day trip, but you're going to, you know, die at the end of it. You know, come on, you know. He's not telling him, right? So he's, he has no one. And so, you know, when you, when you talk about taking this step of faith with God, sometimes it can be very, very isolating and very, very difficult. Back to Genesis 22, verse 5, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and the lad and I will go over there, and we will worship, and get this, and return to you. He said, we'll return to you. Now, you've got one of two options later that we'll talk about, okay? Okay. Either he was lying or he actually believed it. Okay, those are the only two options. Either he lied, we're coming back, or he actually believed it, okay? And so Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. Again, Abraham was old, so the boy gets to carry the own wood that he's going to be used to be sacrificed, the fire, the kindling for the fire, the fire and the knife. The two of them walked together. They walked together. And Isaac spoke to Abraham and said, My father, he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood. And then the dreaded question that Abraham hoped would never come. He almost made it. He almost made it all the way to the place that God said he was going to sacrifice his son without having the question. Thank goodness it took place here and not at the very beginning of the trip. But he said, He said, Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? To which Abraham said, God will provide the lamb for himself for the burnt offering, my son. And so the two of them walked on together. You remember back that Abraham, when he was called, he was a city dweller in the land of Ur, Mesopotamia, uh, a modern city. And God called him on a camping trip to go to a land he, quote, knew not, right? So he didn't know where the heck he was going, no road map. God just called him out, and so the rest of his life he would dwell in tents. Not in the city. 1,200 mile journey, by the way. Took months. They walked. Then God calls him to go offer his son as a sacrifice. And at the time, he's in Beersheba to Mount Moriah, all right? And that was 50 miles, three days. Now they're at the foot of the place that they're, and when we say Mount Moriah, we're not talking about a huge mountain, it's more of a hill, all right? And, and they're at the foot of this hill, all right? And, uh, and now it's Maybe 250 yards to go. Let me ask you a question. What was the longest journey? The 1,200 miles, the 50 miles, or the 250 yards? It is amazing how the shortest distance can become the longest. It is amazing how when we're in times of trials, time just stops. And for some of you, you're there today. Time has stopped for you. It seems like an eternity. It's the 250-yard journey that you're on. And you would take 1,200 miles in a heartbeat. It's just the emotional experience that we go through when we're going through difficult things. And everything in his heart is screaming, don't do this. Now, here's 
what we know about Abraham. And this is, by the way, why the Bible is such a unique book, okay? The transparency and honesty in the Word of God is unbelievable. It's unlike any other religious book. See, other religions whitewash the histories of their characters to try to make them something they are not. The Bible never does that. Because what we know about Abraham is that he was less than a perfect man. Can we just say that? Many times, two in particular occasions that we're aware of, he allowed for his fear to override his faith and did something because of his emotion of fear that he should not have done. You go back to Genesis chapter 12, and in verse 12, Abraham says to his wife, When the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me. Why? Because she's so beautiful. All right? They will kill me. They will let you live. So say that you are my sister so that I will be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. It will bode better for me if I'm your brother. If they know I'm your husband, they're going to kill me. Lie for me. To which she did. And so you think, okay, so he learned his lesson. You know, that was a mistake. He allowed fear to override him at that moment, and and he did something was wrong, right? He would learn his lesson. Well, there became another incident that we find in Genesis chapter 20, very similar, okay, um, by a king by the name of Abimelech, all right? And and, uh, he came into this region, verse 20, uh, or verse 1 says of Genesis chapter 20. And then in verse 2, it says, Abraham said of his wife Sarah, she is my sister, Uh, And so this king took her as his wife. Then in verse 10, later on, Abimelech, you know, because he's got all kinds of problems, he finds out it's because of this woman. He finds out Abraham's actually her husband. And and he basically calls in Abraham and says, why'd you do this? I mean, why, why in the world would you do this to me? And he said, you know what? He says this, I knew that there was no fear of God in this place, and I thought that you would kill me because of my wife. Twice he allowed for his fear to trump his faith, all right? And you know what? Our fears, they can override our faith. They do all the time. We do things that we know we shouldn't do because of our feelings, because of the emotion, because of the fears. And you know what? Fear can be the number one enemy of faith. And some of you have succumbed to fear in your life It's overridden your faith, okay? I'm not here to condemn you. God is not here to condemn you. Here's what God is saying to you. You cannot always allow for your fear to override your faith. At some point, you have to demonstrate your faith by overcoming your fear and choosing to trust God and just do it. Regardless of what you think the consequences might be, God is calling us to faith. At some point, Abraham ignored his feelings, his anguish, his grief, and all of that. He quickly did what God told him to do. We can imagine all the things that were going through in his head, and yet we understand that he chose to trust God in faith at this moment. Is it possible that God is calling you at this moment, even though all your fears are telling you to do something different, that you're going to trust God at this moment by faith? Friends, it is faith, not feelings. That's the way we are called to live our lives. And yet, what I find amazing here, back in Genesis 22, is verse 5 when he said, we will worship and we will return. Again, two options. Either he was lying or he actually believed it. Well, I'm inclined to believe he believed it. Why? Because in Hebrews chapter 11, the passage actually that we're studying today in verse 19, it says this, He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead from which he received him back as a type. Isn't that amazing? That he actually believed that God could raise him from the dead. He was so determined to be obedient to God at this point of his life when the ultimate ask came he trusted God and I'm friends this is not simply that he would bring him back to life this was not only a death this was a burnt offering as well can you imagine that imagine the feat that it would take and the faith that it would take that God would somehow restore his body there were all kinds of obstacles all kinds of reasons that he shouldn't believe this and yet he believed it he believed that God would provide 
Abraham set all emotion aside. And so we see this amazing commitment, his commitment, verses 9 through 12, Genesis 22. They came back to that place that God had told them. He built an altar, arranged the wood, bound his son, laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. What's he doing? He's following through. He is committed to do exactly what God called him to do. And let me tell you something very clearly, friends. When it comes to faith, good intentions count for nothing. Okay? We always give ourselves the benefit of the doubt with our good intentions. We may not have done exactly what God intended us for us to do or asked us to do, but we had good intentions. And the reason that we took another route is because of our, quote, good intentions. Good intentions don't count. Okay, true faith is all about the follow-through. What do I mean by that? It's obedience. That's why we're saying mustard seed faith, 1%, good enough. 1% is good enough as long as it's followed up with what? Obedience. 100% obedience. God is all about the follow-through. Doing what he calls us to do. James doubles down on this in James chapter 2, verse 14, when he says, What use is it, my brother, if someone says, I have faith? But has no works. Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and need of daily food, if someone says to him, go in peace, be warm, be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? You may have had a warm feeling inside. Good intentions, not did anything about it, but it was your heart was in the right place. If James is saying, listen, if you don't do something about it, he said, even so, if it has no works by itself, Faith, okay, it's dead by itself. Faith is dead by itself. See, we prove our faith through testing. Faith must be validated. God will always validate your faith. God will take you through things in your life, sometimes the ultimate ask, the hardest thing. And you'll say, really, God? And God says, really, to validate your faith. We go through testing in every area of our lives. Why not in the spiritual arena? You're sick, you go to the doctor, they do tests. You know, you go to a mechanic, he plugs something in under your dashboard, air codes come up. It's a test. You get a driver's license, you take a test. You go to school, you go to high school, you take the SAT test. God will test your faith. It's a part of refining us. This happens to be... Abraham's defining moment, and he passes with flying colors. And we see this amazing reward of his faith. In Genesis chapter 22, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad. Do nothing, for now I know that you fear God. That you've not even withheld your own son from me. And Abraham raised his eyes and he looked and behold, there was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. He went and he took the ram. He offered him as a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name that will be called, the Lord will provide. (laughs) That's what they called it. Just like he said. That's the name that he called it. Why? Because he told his boy, the Lord will provide. He did not lie to his son. God actually provided. And the reward we see, he was rewarded with three things on that day. Number one, his son was rescued. Number two, he received the approval of God. But number three, he entered into a deeper relationship with the Lord. And that's exactly what God does for us. When we're obedient in faith, you know what? God comes to the rescue. We have approval that comes from God and we go into a deeper relationship with the Lord. When you have tested the Lord in that sense and found him to be faithful, when he tests you, And you do it, and you find God to be faithful. It's an amazing thing. Your confidence in God will grow. Faith must be validated to be approved by God. We're going to have communion this morning. I'm going to ask the guys now if they would go get ready for that. As Abraham was faced with overwhelming emotion... He did not act purely upon his feelings. He came back from the mountain with a closer relationship with God. You know the statement, uh, you know, lay it all at the altar or lay it all on the altar? Some of you have been around for a while. You'll remember that statement. Um, What does that mean? I mean, it's like, you know, do we just, you know, put stuff up here in front? Is that the altar? Is this the altar? You know, what is that up there? You know, no, it's a bistro table. You know, I mean... 
what does it mean, lay it all on the altar? It means that God wants all of us. He wants all of us. He wants everything. What's the hardest thing for us to lay on the altar? What's your hardest thing? You know, it's so interesting in this particular story because in this instance, it happened to be his children, his child in particular. Parents, what's the hardest thing to put on the altar? (laughs) It's our kids. You know, and it's not just when they're babies. You know, we dedicate them as children up here on the stage when they're babies, but we take them back immediately. You know, we, let's just be honest, right? And then we spend our whole life stressing out about them. And then, you know, even when they're adults and they're making their own decisions, you know, we feel guilty like, you know, what, what did we do wrong? You know, I mean, it's our fault. You know, we, I mean, and we, 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 you know, have our children. We feel responsible. We stay guilty until we die, you know, and that's it. We have such a hard time. And then grandchildren come along and we feel responsible. And it just, it never stops, right? For a lot of us, it's saying, okay, Lord, they're yours. They're not making the decisions that I want them to make. I don't know where it's going or what's happening, but Lord, I'm I'm just going to give them to you again. See, laying it on the altar is not a one-time event. It's a continual thing. Communion, it's not a one-time event. It's a continual thing. You know why? Because our fear causes our faith to fail so many times. Our emotions lead us to places that we never dreamed we would go. And just like Abraham, we blow it. And we need forgiveness. God understands that. Communion's a time to take whatever God is speaking to you at this moment, lay it on the altar, and give it to him. Father, as we spend this time in communion, uh, I pray that you would bring to mind those things that we need to lay on the altar again. Uh, Lord, forgive us for the way that we take it back. And we rationalize and we, we, we try to work things out. Lord, it's just a part of our humanness. And yet we're reminded again of Abraham and his great faith. That, Lord, you want faith to be validated. And the validation of that faith is the follow through. So, Lord, help us to do business with you right now during communion. And may we be people of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. As the elements are being passed, can I talk to you just for a moment before um, we take communion? I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I always struggled with this story about Abraham and Isaac. I've always had a, a hard time 
that God would ask something like this of someone. And then it was almost like a cruel trick, you know. Why, why would God at the last minute, you know, just spare him? And, and it just, it never set well with me, you know. So I, and, and for those of you who maybe never heard this story before, you, you might be really struggling with that too, thinking this just doesn't seem like right. It doesn't seem like God would do something like that. And then a number of years ago, I was in a deeper study in the book of Romans, and um, I saw something that um, it just, it was one of those aha moments, you know, when, when stuff kind of comes together. And it happened to be in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, and it says in verse 31, a verse that we all like, what shall we say then of, to these things? You know, if God is for us, who can be against us? We love that verse because, you know, yeah. That's that Joshua thing, you know, in the Old Testament. God's with you. You know, who can be against you and all those things. But verse 32 is so incredibly profound. And this is what it says. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for all of us, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? The very thing that bothered me about what God did with Abraham and Isaac, God followed through with his own son. And everything changed at that moment for me. I mean, all of a sudden I thought, oh my goodness, the very thing that I was upset with God at, in a sense, that he would ask something like this of a servant of his, he did because of his great love for us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. With all of our failures, with all of the times that we just cave in, you know, because of our fear, and we do the wrong thing, God still loves us. And he sacrificed his son. He didn't withhold the knife, in that sense, from his own son. See, that's the kind of savior we have in Jesus. That's the kind of God we have. And so I don't know where you're coming from today, but how you feel about God and how you feel about what you're going through in your life right now. But I just want to tell you this. I want to remind you this, that God loves you and that he proved it. It's not just empty words. It's not just good intentions. It's follow through. He followed through and did exactly the very thing that we could never do. I wouldn't give my son for any of you. Couldn't do it. God did it, what we couldn't do, okay? And so in the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, broke it, and said, this is my body, which is for you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Also, after supper, taking the cup, he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread, drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We proclaim that God did for us what none of us would do for anyone else. Gave his only begotten son that we would not experience eternal annihilation from the Lord, but eternal life with him because of his great love for us. Father, we thank you for your great love for us. And God, for the challenges of our faith and the fears that we experience, Lord, I pray that we would be people of faith. Um, sometimes it's the big ask that we struggle with, Lord, and if that's true for any person here today, God, that they would be faithful to you, be people of faith. And as we give these offerings, we pray that you would use them, God, to advance your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.